Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Pyeongchang hands over the next Winter Olympics to Beijing, the host of the 2022 Games. But the bigger triumph beyond sports may be the apparent fall in Korean Peninsula relations. Will the diplomatic momentum be sustained after the Games? And we present this week a World Inside series on female achievers from around the world, the women on top. The first in the series is an interview with IMF Managing Director Kristin Lagarde, who talks about the contributions of female leaders in the world. And let's start our program today in the snowy city of Pyeongchang in South Korea, where the Winter Olympic Games wrapped up on Sunday. At the closing ceremony, Beijing, which will host the next Winter Games, presented an eight-minute preview, which showed a modern, confident China. The handover performance, which conveyed China's warm, high-tech welcome, was created by renowned filmmaker Zhang Yimou, who was also in charge of the opening and closing ceremonies of the 20. 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics. During the Pyeongchang Games, the spotlight is not only on the athletes, but also on the apparent flaw in the inter-Korean relations. Many, including South Korea, have referred to it as a breakthrough. But not everyone is happy about it. Let's take a look at the warming ties during the Winter Games. The beginning of a new year has seen a fast-forward warming process. Pyongyang and Seoul reopened talks that had been closed for over two years in less than 10 days. On January 2nd, South Korea proposed high-level talks in response to DPRK leader Kim Jong-un's offer to send delegations to Pyongyang. January 3rd, the cross-border hotline reopened and talks were confirmed two days later. January 9th, talks at the Peace House on the south side of the Panmunjom Truce Village paved the way. On February 9th, the high-level DPRK delegation was in the Olympic opening ceremony. Kim Yo-jong, sister of DPRK leader Kim Jong-un, was there. South Korean President Moon Jae-in shook hands with the DPRK's top legislator Kim Yong-nam. The two countries' joint hockey team made its debut under the unified flag. On February 10th, Moon met and had lunch with a DPRK delegation at the Blue House. Kim Yo-jong delivered Kim Jong-un's letter on improving ties and relayed her brother's invitation to Moon for a visit. Moon said he would create an opportunity. The next day, Moon watched the second performance of the DPRK art troupe with Pyongyang's delegation in Seoul. On February 12th, Kim Jong-un expressed his thanks to the South while meeting with the returned DPRK delegation. He said he was impressed by the warm welcome to the delegation and appreciates the kind-hearted reception. While intercreation relations were warming up, the U.S. was trying to cool them down. On February 10th, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence's scheduled meeting with DPRK officials in South Korea was canceled at the last minute. He had previously condemned Pyongyang for human rights abuses, and Washington had imposed new sanctions. The same day, Pence again called for denuclearization. On the 14th, Pence said the U.S. was open to talks with the DPRK, but sanctions would stay until Pyongyang abandoned its nuclear program. On February 23rd, President Trump reaffirmed his campaign of maximum pressure, and Washington announced its largest installment of economic sanctions on Pyongyang. The heaviest sanctions ever imposed on a country before. So, could the diplomatic momentum at the Winter Olympic Games lead to talk between the DPRK and the United States? Let's turn to our panel in Beijing. We have Mr. Zhao Tong, who is a fellow at the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Program based at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Sir, welcome to our program. And joining us in the United States in Washington, D.C., Brian Becker, a national coordinator of the Answer Coalition, that is a policy analyst uh, on DPRK relations, the author of the book, Imperialism in the 21st Century. I want to welcome both of you. First of all, Mr. Zhao here in Beijing, as a close neighbor and as a country that has been instrumental in the six-party talks earlier, what does China think about the recent apparent warming up of relations? I think China would be very pleased 
Um, I know uh, Vice Premier uh, Liu Yandong was uh, in Pyeongchang during the closing ceremony, and she also had a meeting with President Moon Jae-in, and they apparently uh, exchanged views on the Korean nuclear crisis. Um, I think the recent uh, positive development uh, was viewed by Beijing as an important breakthrough mm. and could lead to further opportunities uh, to have direct engagement between North Korea and the United States, the two main players in okay. this crisis. Okay, since we talk about the breakthrough, let's see how big a breakthrough this is and how sustainable it will be. Let's go to Mr. Becker in Washington, D.C. Now, here's the thing. The United States has levied against the DPRK right before the closing ceremony, so-called heaviest sanctions ever toward the DPRK. However, there was also the possibility of talk and discussion between the U.S. and the DPRK, according to the Vice President Pence. So what exactly is the message? Um, I think the message is that the United States is applying maximum pressure but it's not only on the DPRK, which is the announced policy. It's also applying maximum pressure on South Korea. The real uh, fear that Washington has, that the U.S. government has, and I don't think it's just Trump. I think it's a bigger parts of the military industrial complex and their political operatives in Washington. What they really fear is that peace will break out in the Korean Peninsula, whereby South and North Korea begin a process of de-escalating tensions, have a thaw, possible normalization, and Washington is on the outside right. looking in. So we have a... Got it. You seem to have some kinds of, uh, what shall we call, the strategy that you perceive that the United States would have. Uh, let's go to some specifics, Mr. Zhao. When it comes to facts, once again, the fact is it's mixed signal coming from the United States. Rhetorics vis-a-vis -vis actions, but at the same time, there seems to be a possibility of warming up. How big is it? I think, in fact, the uh, mixed signals from the U.S. in recent weeks and days have become clearer. Uh, they are increasingly speaking with one voice. Um, right now, after Vice President Pence openly said uh, U.S. would be willing uh, to mm. conduct so-called talks for talks, with North Korea without preconditions. Uh, that view was not uh, backtracked by the White House. Uh, that seems to represent the um, overall view of the United States government. I think that's a major change of position by really? the United States. Because when it comes to the, the talks, what is it to be about? The U.S. also said it is supposed to be about denuclearization. And it has to be uh, complete, verifiable, e uh, irreversible, all of these words have been used uh, during the six party talks earlier for years ago. So, um, is that the bar too high? I think uh, there are two things. Uh, regarding North Korea's nuclear capability, the U.S. position has never changed, mm. which is North Korea has to achieve complete, uh, verifiable, and irreversible nuclear disarmament in the near term future. Um, that bar is very high and hasn't been lowered. Mm. But the US, what the U.S. is saying is Washington is willing to talk with, you know, uh, with North Korea, which is different from negotiating with North Korea. Okay. Negotiations are about how the North Korea should reduce and even uh, ultimately give up its nuclear weapons. But talks means the two sides simply get, get in touch mm. with each other to, to improve mutual uh, understanding. Mr. Becker, do you read the same kinds of message as Mr. Zhao, or there is a sea difference between your opinions? Uh, I have a somewhat different opinion. I think the U.S. is now saying that they're willing to talk and not negotiate, as he said, and I think that's a correct and appropriate um, sort of nuance there. But I think the reason that Washington says it wants to talk is it doesn't want to be completely isolated because there's momentum between the North and the South for talks, and of course China and Russia also welcome that. Uh, but what I think the, the thing that we should be looking at is what Donald Trump said the other day, with the announcement of the harshest sanctions yet on, on DPRK, and they're, not, uh, they're unilateral. They're not coming through the UN Security Council, and they allow and, and set the stage for the interdiction of, of ships on the high seas. Uh, in other words, a brave, bold, audacious move that could create incidents that would allow 
a, a new provocation to lead into mm -hmm. some sort of even limited military conflict. I think that's where the Trump administration really is. They're trying to wiggle their way out of the, the, pos the problem right now that everybody wants to talk except them. Mm. Interesting. But even after that, even after the Trump administration so-called uh, levied the heaviest uh, sanctions, all these are in quotes, of course, against the DPRK. The DPRK, in fact, Mr. Becker, if I could point out, said we could talk. We could still talk. That is after the U.S. said we're going to levy you with the heavy sanctions. So how would you read that? I think the DPRK is very committed to a process that can lead to the uh, de-escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. I think the DPRK ultimately wants to talk. Fundamentally, they don't want war. They know that would be suicide, but they want a security guarantee. That can only come really from Washington. It won't come from the, uh, South Korea. It won't come from China. It won't come from Russia. It has to come from the United States. So yes, North Korea is very willing to talk. There's a, there's a great opportunity here if Washington changes its orientation. Mm, Mr. Zhao? Uh, I uh, very much agree. Um, I, we about? Have, we have about the North Korean willing to talk with the United States directly. Uh, we really have to distinguish the North Korean rhetoric from its own from its real intention. Uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, the North Korean uh, rhetoric was still that North Korea would never beg for talks with the United States, uh, not for the next 100, even 200 years. But in fact, uh, what uh, President uh, Moon Jae-in uh, told the uh, international community after uh, you know, talking with the North Korean delegate at the opening ceremony was that the North Korean was, call, uh, you know, quote, uh, fully willing to uh, talking with the United States. I think um, th which uh, was an important uh, change of position um, from the North Korean part. Uh, South Korea has tried to engage with North Korea for many months right mm. after um, President Moon Jae-in came into power. But it's the North Koreans, after achieving a credible uh, strategic nuclear deterrent, after successfully testing three ICBMs, I think they feel they have completed stage one of their goal, which mm. is obtaining a deterrent. Then they are moving into stage two, which is to deal with the consequences of getting their nuclear weapons. So I think the North Korea made an important change, and that's a real opportunity we should take advantage of. About that bottom line, the United States has said, which is about denuclearization, the North Koreans, according to the media reports, have said this. The denuclearization will be the end goal, but many talks could start and many uh, in fact there are many ways to start a process that's a quote directly coming from Mr. Kim who is the vice chairman of the ruling party in DPRK which attended the closing ceremony in Pyeongchang. Uh, Mr. Becker what do you make of that? Well I, I think it really does demonstrate the desire on the part of the DPRK and it's been their desire all along and especially after they feel they have a bottom line, a foundational level of deterrence with their nuclear program and their mm. missile technology program to open up talks with the United States and with South Korea. North Korea, like all other countries, wants to trade. It wants to live in peace. Uh, the Korean War has gone on now for, you know, since 1950. We're now in the 68th year, almost 70 years. Right. It's time for the Korean War to end, and I think the DPRK really wants that. Uh, it's not helpful to the DPRK to divert so much of its money into military spending instead of consumer spending, uh, but they need a security guarantee. It's kind of simple, actually, but uh, so far the U.S. hasn't been willing to give it. Perhaps the U.S. is seeking a pretext to maintain the so-called Asia pivot, uh, which deploys so much of the U.S. Air Force and Navy into the Pacific region. Perhaps that's the reason, but All North right. Korea is willing to go, I think. All right. The U.S. delegation at the closing ceremony was led by President Trump's daughter, Ivanka, who is also his advisor, who doesn't have an official position besides that. Mrs. Ms. Trump, rather, uh, also cheered for the athletes from the DPRK and South Korea, something like Mike Pence refused to do. The security clearance status of Ms. Trump and her husband and their access to classified information have come under scrutiny in recent weeks, of course, according to some news. When asked why Ivanka Trump had the appropriate security clearance, Secretary of Treasury Steve Milchin said that she has the appropriate access to brief the president. Well, will she, that is the question, bringing the messages 
back home, it seems that, uh, uh, Mr. Zhao, that there was not direct discussion and interaction between North Koreans and the American delegation, at least at the closing ceremony. I'm afraid uh, we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think similar things happened during the opening ceremony uh, before the scheduled secret meeting between the North Korean and American senior officials. Both sides uh, categorically said they were not uh, scheduled to meet. There was no meeting. But in fact, we found out later that they were scheduled to meet secretly, even though that didn't happen because North Koreans later pulled out of the meeting due to the uh, sanctions threat from uh, Pence. Mm. Uh, so we don't know. We may, we may find out later they somehow met or uh, ran into each other uh, incidentally right. or arranged. But, but I think um, the message uh, delivered by Ivanka Trump was uh, positive. Uh, he, uh, her appearance uh, sent the message that the U.S. was willing to engage at the high level right. with North Korean counterparts. All right. Before we go, I do want to ask both of you about the role of South Korea. Earlier, South Korea was in a position that it has to work with many others in order to bring any momentum. And now it seems South Korea, with a president playing a constructive role now, be able to bring the two parties, North Korea and the United States, even closer. And the president of South Korea emphasized about having warming relations between the North Korea and the Americans, while at the same time the North-South are warming up their relationship. And Mr. Becker, how important is it? Can they be done parallelly? Uh, in, in some ways, if you look at history, they have to be done in parallel. Uh, when Bill Clinton was in the last year of his administration, he sent Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State, to, to Pyongyang. She met with Kim Jong-il. Uh, that was taking place in tandem with Kim Dae-jung's uh, sunshine policy and reaching out to Kim Jong-il in the historic summit of June uh, 2000 between the two Koreas. Uh, it's very hard for South Korea because it has limited sovereignty because it has U.S. troops All on right. the soil. Uh, to, to be able to go forward without the uh, permission of the United States. So, yes, they're trying to do it in parallel. That's Moon Jae-in's goal right now. Well, but it's likely due to uh, April the 1st, the military exercise between South Korea and the United States. But, of course, the latent statement, we still do not know when is the exact time. But, Mr. Zhao, that's going to be a big test for Seoul. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so doesn't have much time uh, to make sure the two sides directly uh, engage. But with that said, I think uh, U.S. can send some flexible signals, uh, even if the joint exercises take place uh, in April, uh, in um, without being further postponed. Uh, the U.S. can make some adjustments to the content of the exercises. In fact, based on what I heard. The U.S. has already made some adjustments to its previous exercises mm -hmm. in the fall of last year, removing some of the most threatening elements of the exercises, such as uh, practicing decapitation uh, operations against North Korean leaders from those drills. Okay. And the U.S. could do similar things. That can uh, implicitly send a softening message to North Korea and make an opportunity for engagement. Things are still evolving. But we want to thank both of you for being with us. Uh, Brian Baker and Zhao Tong, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with us. You are watching World Inside. After talking about a possible man in Korean Peninsula relations at the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, let's focus now on the Games itself. China took home nine medals. Liu Jiayu snatched the silver medal in the women's snowboard half pipe on the fourth day. That's China's first at the game. Well, Wu Da Jin won the 500 meters in the men's short track speed skating. That's the first and only gold medal for Team China. With the Olympic flame extinguished in South Korea, the torch has been passed on to Beijing, the host of the 2022 Winter Games. People across the nation are anticipating the event with the hopes of presenting yet another unique display of culture and sports. And furthermore about that, Let's go to our panelist, Yan Chiang. Welcome back to our program, a sports Thank commentator, you. founder of Score Sports, joining us here Thank in you. Beijing. 
Thank you, sir. In Athens, Ohio, we have uh, Norman O'Reilly, a professor and chair of the Department of Sports Administration at the College of Business in Ohio University. Also served in the Canadian Olympic Committee as the mission staff member of the Athens and also Beijing and Vancouver Olympic Games as well. Welcome to both of you. I want to start with you, Yan. Yep. So, Team China, your assessment about the performance, briefly. Uh. Uh, we're too busy with our spring festival arrangements, so <laughs> I kind of neglected the performances. Oh, you're very but, diplomatic, shall I say. But, but there are still quite some uh, uh, exciting topics in regarding uh -huh. to the Winter Olympics. I'm just saying exciting in regarding to referees, <laughs> in regarding to the uh, medal tally, the ranking. But uh, we cannot say this is a very successful uh, Team China's performance. Uh, in Winter Olympics. The uh, question is, will they do better four years from now? That's for sure, you know, as a hosting nation. Uh, you know, one major battlefield would be on the uh, um, speed uh, skating competition for the short track in yes. between China and South Korea. Mm. And South Korea as the hosting nation, we should have anticipated that they would gain all kinds of advantages of home grounds, of uh, reference decisions, and uh, to be frankly with you, a majority of audience from China were not really um, sure about the regulations, the intricacy of the regulations of this competition. So mm -hmm. there are quite a lot of misunderstandings. And uh, anyhow, you are fighting against the hosting nation. But right. next time, it will be another way around. But you have to be strong yourself. Yeah. In order to be the winner, that is the thing. Let's go to Professor O'Reilly also. What do you make, sir, of the performances of all teams? including coming from the United States, Canada, and, Nor and Norway, of course. Yeah, um, I, I have a, a, specific to Team China, I have a, a different view, I, I think. I mean, versus the Summer Olympics, where China is so successful in the Winter Games, we've seen a pretty strong progression. So the last three games, a similar number of medals, but I would expect to see a jump when you host. We saw that in Canada, we've seen that in Australia, around Sydney Olympics, Canada, Vancouver. I can tell you as a Canadian, um, we're very proud. This was the best Winter Olympics we've ever had to come second overall. But that's been a program that started around the lead up to the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games, a program called Own the Podium, mm. which has seen an enormous amount of investment in Canadian sport that led up to, and you saw those increases like China has seen now, and a big spike at Vancouver, and then Canada has stayed there and then spiked again. So it's built a real system right. of, uh, of high performance sport for winter sports, talent identification programs, bringing athletes in. In the United States, there's, been, there's a bit of a somber attitude. There, there's a bit of a, That's right. uh, people aren't as happy with the performance here as has been in the past. Mm. And, and, yeah. uh, yes, different teams are getting different kinds of performance this time. For the past 100 years, countries have equated the Olympic medal table with national pride, though. This year, the 5.3 million strong nation of Norway topped the medal table with 14 gold medals. Winter sports powerhouse United States came in fourth with nine gold and South Korea underperformed as a host nation even though there were different complaints coming from different countries including China about it. Placing the seventh with five golds and the next Olympic host China came 16th in the medal table with just one gold from short track speed skater. Well next time, four years from now, Beijing, the question is, is the winter sport going to be popular in China. You need to build a certain kind of foundation in order to make it prosper. You got, for now, a 12 million people ski once in the year 2017. Yep. Okay, you got a nation of 1.4 billion. The goal is 300 million by the year 2020. So it's impossible. We're not competing on the snow surface. We're competing on the icy surface. Oh, okay, there we go. Oh, is that well, the way to do it? Yeah. Of course, in, uh, regarding to gain more medals achievements, that would be the shortcut. But uh, I've witnessed a huge uh, um, progress in participation on snow-related sports for the past several years. Skiing has become a very popular, a very Porsche, but not so high end of the market thing now. Mm. So more and more people, even people of my age, not as young as you are, we are participating in skiing. I take it skin. as a compliment. Um, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to Mr. O'Reilly. I mean, what kind of foundation when it comes to you know, the number of people participating in the sport so that that sport could prosper and take off? Yeah, it's a great question. The first thing I would say was we know from the research that 
that participation and spectatorship are mutually exclusive, two different things. For example, figure skating has the largest ratings around the world for the Winter Olympic Games, and very few people actually figure skate. So I think that's the first thing to keep in mind. If you think about luge, you think about snowboard, half pipe, and cross. These are exciting sports to watch, but most people want to, don't want to do them. Mm. I think there's two pieces here. One is you want the games as a motivator to get people skiing or skating or more healthier activities, but also in terms of the spectatorship, most of the new events that have joined the Olympics that have been very popular, some right. of the snowboard and ski and cross and the way they've redesigned cross-country skiing to be more exciting with mass audiences, those are really for you and I to want to watch. Yeah. But not to do. So I think that's the important thing. The games have two very distinct things. And yeah, yeah, around it, it, participation, it does. there's really been a, a lot of that. It does, but, but, but at the same time, yeah. sir, it has to make the budget because there is a budget for the infrastructure. There's a budget for the stadium building. There's a budget for the snow making. There is a, a budget for getting money back through the spectators. If people are not going there, if people are not in the sport, how are you going to get the money back? Uh, Mr. Yan, has China thought about that? Yes, of course. Uh, we will have made a very detailed preparation for uh, our snow uh, stadiums or, or all the facilities, in, especially in Zhang Jiaqiu. And uh, uh, I remember about uh, uh, 17 or 16 months ago, we were here in this program with Ms. Xu Jicheng, uh -huh. who is the head of the NBC of the 2022 Olympics. And uh, I think he gave us a detailed explanation of how China exactly. was preparing for all that. And uh, with a huge increase in the uh, participants of skiing, of uh, all these Winter Olympics all related right. sports, we would uh, uh, hopefully <laughs> we would, uh, expect you know, more revenue you know, comparing to the uh, Olympics uh, in 2008. All right, Yan Chang and Norman O'Reilly, with both of your explanations, I've got a bit of confidence for the four years from now, the Beijing Zhang Jiaqiu Winter Olympic Games. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Insights. Still to come on our program, this week we have a series of female outliers entitled Women on Top. Our first one on one conversation on the contribution of women leaders is with IMF Managing Director Kristen Lagarde. That interview right after this break. Women are said to hold up half the sky. And they pull their own weight around the world, making their mark in their chosen fields. Jian Wei gets up close with all these women on top. Get to know how they do it all. Tune in to World Insight. This week, we are bringing you our special series of interviews, Women on Top. The first is with Miss. Kristen Lagarde, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. She rose to the top of the IMF in the year 2011. She has helped to safeguard the stability of the international monetary system into her second term. With China inviting global players to share the benefits of the Belt and Road Initiative, Ms. Lagarde says the IMF is perfectly capable of providing technical expertise to help Belt and Road members. When Christine Lagarde was appointed as the 11th and first female managing director of the IMF, Europe was struggling through the international financial crisis. During her past years in this position, the IMF played important roles in promoting international financial stability and monetary cooperation. With China becoming the second largest economy in the world, cooperation between the IMF and China is growing fast. The IMF has been working with the Chinese government in various international mechanisms. Yet, the Belt and Road Initiative is providing an even larger stage for the IMF to better perform its expertise on policy coordination between the BRI members. As part of the BRI project, the IMF has signed an agreement with the Chinese government. It is going to bring its goals of technical and financial expertise. Well, first of all, the Belt and Road Initiative is, in my view, a very positive proposal by China. And it is positive from a growth perspective. We have always advocated infrastructure projects around the world, both hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure as well, in order to support growth in the short term, but also to improve the terms 
in the longer perspective. And that's exactly what it is doing. But it is doing it in a very special way, which is a coordinated way. That's where the IMF can play a role. We can help the coordination of policies between the various members of the Belt and Road Initiative. And we can also provide technical assistance. As part of the BRA project, we have signed an agreement with the Chinese authorities and we're going to dedicate capacity development expertise that we have in Beijing for those who will need special technical assistance, special training in order to put in place efficient uh, infrastructure projects, in order to coordinate at all levels. Mm -hmm. And from those two perspectives, policy coordination, capacity building, we can really provide uh, the uh, decades of expertise that we have in these fields. The RMB fund that the Chinese president has pledged to establish worldwide. IMF has been an instrumental organization nurturing the growing of RMB together with other international currencies. What do you make of this specific pledge and also what does that mean for IMF's future work with Chinese government and the Chinese financial circle? Well, first of all, I, I really uh, command uh, the initiative and the funding. Where we can help is by, make, by, by offering the expertise, the technical assistance that we have in identifying projects, mm. in optimizing uh, the financing, and in applying good principles. Do you know, for instance, that between a project that is well-governed that is efficient mm. and a project that is poorly governed and inefficient, I guess this they can be a difference, difference of 100%. So, uh, you know, this is massive funding and it needs to deliver massive results for the good of the project. That's where we can help. Madam Lagarde, there have been different debates about what is the nature of BRI. Mm -hmm. Is it globalization 2.0, as China said? Or is it part of a new globalization, as you beautifully mentioned several times internationally? Or is it China's geopolitical ambition involved? What exactly is it from your perspective? For the project to be successful, it has to be mutually beneficial mm. for all the participants. It's the virtue of the network, of the connections, of the interrelationships and the linkages that will be established that will actually deliver the added value to each and every project, to each and every country. It's a bit like, you know, some of the inventions of the past, uh, the telephones, or any w anything that is based on network and connections. If you only have a small number of connected beneficials, it's going to remain a small project. Mm. If everybody is connected, if everybody benefits, then it's going to be a successful venture. So I think that it's difficult to articulate a single purpose because each and every participant will see benefits to it. But that's the key, that everybody can benefit from it mm. and that there is this sort of joint approach to mutually um, beneficial outcome uh, at all countries' levels, which is why policy coordination and governance will matter in the long run. Well said. But do you think people are going to be used to Let's just say, first of all, an idea coming from a developing country, China is the largest developing country, as China believes, uh, for international governance. You know, the, the longest initiatives, whether it's in economic terms or in geopolitical terms, are based on consultation, coordination, mm -hmm. respect and tolerance. And I think if those principles are applied, it can still be a very successful and long-term proposition. You talk about the financial system for all. Mm -hmm. I do want you to explain how that would work, for example, this time with an initiative coming from developing countries and widely consulted by all. Well, today as we speak, uh, there are millions and millions and millions of people who are outside the financial sector. And number one, it is not fair. Number two, it is economically counterproductive. To give you an example, 
There are many SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises around the world, which do not have access to finance properly. Number two, if you look at gender, women are generally underbanked, uh, underserved when it comes to financial uh, access or financial literacy. And it's not fair, but it's counterproductive because if SMEs had proper access, if women had better access, they could participate in the economy, they could leverage their talent, they could accomplish themselves. So it's, it's only uh, fair and economically sensible to facilitate financial access to all. Mm. Now we are lucky at the moment because technologies facilitate that. You no longer need to have a brick and mortar bank branch to have access to finance. You can use mobile banking. You can use virtual currencies in some cases. You can effect cash transactions without cash. This is particularly the case in Beijing mm -hmm. or in other places. Um, you can spend the whole day without cash. That's right. Right? You can use your bike, you can use your phone, you can do your purchases, you can go online. Yeah, let me tell you, it's very easy to spend your money that way. <laughs> which takes me to my second <laughs> point, to my second point, mm. which is control. Mm. Each and every one of us will have to sort of be very aware of that and be very cautious and accountable to oneself and to one's family because you can't just go on spending. The same is true at the global level from a policy perspective. We need to have in place the regulations and the controls mm. so that that financial system does not get outside of control and has a life of its own because we know that we risk paying a high price for that as we did back in 2008. Many are very impressed by your strong leadership within the IMF and also on the international stage. I'm saying they're this way not too good. <laughs> not because you're sitting right in front of me. As someone in this very crucial organization, at the juncture of change of our world. How much do you think leadership mean and what should be the qualities of that leadership, the most important ones? I, I think that in any organization, whether it's the IMF or a country or a non-governmental non organization, leadership matters enormously. Uh, it can be exercised in many different ways um, depending on the culture, depending on the talent, you know, I come back to that always, but leadership itself matters. Uh, I equally believe that irrespective of the style of leadership you have or what, you know, suits you, you occasionally have to show a degree of authority. But while you are pushing all the reforms and the changes within the organization, some member countries must be much more in line than the other because changes could impact to different degrees mm -hmm. to different countries of the member members. What would that mean for your relationship with your member states? First of all, we try to be even-handed. Of course. So whether a country is small, medium or large, we have to apply the same principles. And that's the reason why uh, our governance rules matter so much. Sometimes it's a burden. It slows us down a little bit. Sometimes I would like to move faster, but the rules are there to make sure that there is even-handedness between the various members. Second, uh, I try to identify what is really going to be beneficial, what is going to be in the interest of a particular member on the occasion of a change of policy, on the occasion of a new proposal. And I try to identify for that member what is positive about it. And of course, women leadership has been a cause you are very supportive about. Mm. We see some dramatic changes, but not necessary to the degree, some say. There is still a long way to go. And this, this is particularly true in the world of finance. This is particularly true in the, um, in, in the government circles. So there is a lot of progress to be made. And what can I do? Well, uh, I can raise my voice. I can remind the issue of uh, gender inclusion. I can, together with the team, the entire team of the IMF, identify the economic output mm. that women can provide, the leverage that they give, the diversity that uh, they improve, 
and how it makes absolute economic sense. I, um, I used to say it's an economic no-brainer. It's a no-brainer to bring women in vast numbers. And I'm always reminded of the flock of geese that fly in the sky of the Belt and Road. Well, think of the geese. They need two wings, men and women. Just like that. Yes. Thank you so much, Madame Lagarde, for being with us. Thank, Thank you, you all for your time. Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.